this is the story about the greatest bikepacking adventure of my life. Set in the land of the midnight sun. Starting in the scenic and hospitable Lofoden Islands. And ending where the road ends. At the northernmost point of Europe the North Cape. An 1100 kilometer long ride going along jaw-dropping fjords, sandy white beaches, snow-covered peaks, crystal clear water, and some of the most spectacular roads you've ever seen. All these things combined makes this an adventure of a lifetime. Hi there, my name is Michael and I'm also known as Bike Touring Mike. So I've been bikepacking for the last 10 years or so and for the last three years I've been planning on going on this trip. But the state of the world caused me to change my plans for the previous two summers. But they say that third time's a charm. So I was actually able to go on my dream bikepacking trip this summer to the North Cape. I live in the very northernmost part of Sweden. But rather than starting my journey here in my familiar surroundings, I decided to start in the more picturesque Lofoten Islands and make my way up to the North Cape. The distance from the Lofoten Islands up to the North Cape is about 1100 kilometers and I had given myself 12 days to reach the North Cape. But let's start from the beginning and I'll explain more about the journey as the ride continues. In order to get there, I decided to take the Arctic train from my hometown in Swedish Lapland all the way to the city of Narvik in Arctic Norway. One of the northernmost train lines in the world. With towering mountains, dramatic waterfalls and fantastic views of the fjords, this journey goes through a beautiful and wild Arctic landscape and it was the perfect start to my dream backpacking trip. After an eight hour long train ride, I changed to a seven hour bus ride, taking me the last stretch out to the southern tip of the Lofoten Islands. The bus ride gave me a glimpse of all the beauty that lied ahead of me. I finally reached small town of Åre right around midnight, assembled my bike and rode for a few minutes until I found a decent wild camping spot for the night. The next morning I quickly made my way to the small fishing town of Reine, where I got the first great photo opportunity. If you come across photos from Lofoden, they're likely taken right here in Reine. With the traditional red fisherman huts and with the impressive backdrop of the granite peaks shooting up of the fjord, this place has been named one of the most beautiful places in the world and it's easy to understand why. Nowadays, most of the red huts called Råburer have been turned into accommodation for tourists, but during winter, Lofoten is still the center of the cod fishing industry here in Norway, since Lofoten has some of the richest fishing waters in the world. So all over Lofoden you see and definitely smell these dried codfish that hangs on these wooden structures. They're called stockfish and the name comes from the sticks that they are hung from. 
So these fish are caught in February and left to hang here for a couple of months so that they're cured. And then they ship all these fish down to Italy where it's served as an Italian specialty called baccala. Lofoden has these unreal beaches with white sand and turquoise crystal clear water you almost feel like you're in the Caribbean sometimes. That is unless you actually go down to the water and feel how extremely cold the water really is. Wild camping can be a bit tricky in Lofoten since tourism has basically exploded during the last couple of years. But if you just take off the main road for a while and head for a less traveled road, you're sure to find an abundance of amazing wild camping options. Is it just me or can you see all the flies? <laughs> Day two started out with the same great weather I had on the first day. And my first goal of the day was to make it to the small picturesque fishing town of Henningsvær. Well known for its fishing industry, architecture and museums. However, none of these things were the reason that drew me to this place. Instead, what drew me here was the town's football field. In 2021, the Henningsvær football field was named the most beautiful football field in the world by none other than FIFA. Here the local players are able to practice 24-7 under the midnight sun during the summer months. I continued north after Henningsvær and found myself cycling late into the evening, trying to make it to the very top of the Lofoten Islands. My very intense two days of cycling around these islands was about to end. But the islands still had one epic surprise in store for me. The road that I'm cycling on right now is called Midnatsolsvejen or the Midnight Sun Road. A pretty fitting name to a fantastic road here along the Arctic Ocean.
I just have three words to say. This is magical. Just a couple of kilometers later, I made it to my camp spot for the evening. A secret bike shelter that somehow wasn't much of a secret anymore. However, I made it just in time to pitch my tent, sit down in a chair and enjoy a glass of red wine as I enjoyed the midnight sun over the sea. A great ending to a fantastic day. My days in the Lofoten Islands were coming to an end. But I wasn't in despair since I knew my adventure had just started. After about an hour's ride in the morning, I caught the ferry over to the Vesterålen Islands. And after a 30 minute ferry ride, I entered a new chapter of this adventure, the Vesterålen Islands. After cycling for an hour or two, I stopped and enjoyed a nice lunch overlooking the impressive architecture of the Hurtigrotte Museum in Stockmarknäs. And lo and behold, just as I sat there, one of the Hurtigrotten ships actually entered the harbor. The wind picked up in the afternoon. But thankfully I was enjoying a nice tailwind, so I wasn't really complaining. However, I must admit that it was a bit scary going over these impressive bridges in the mighty wind. On day 4 the clouds were back again, plus the wind seemed to have changed and I was now facing a nasty headwind instead of a tailwind. The west coast of Andøya is home to one of Norway's scenic routes. A number of carefully selected beautiful roads designed to showcase Norway's natural wonders, amplified by art, design and architecture. This specific road displays a wide mix of terrain, everything from a jagged coastline to white sandy beaches. And even though it was a bit overcast on this specific day, it was still an incredibly beautiful landscape to ride through. Just imagine what this would look like on a sunny day. Quite a wind here. <laughs> Later in the afternoon I hopped aboard a ferry that would take me to the island of Senja. And after about two hours on the ferry, 
the weather had totally changed from the cold and misty weather back on Andoya to now a sunny and lovely evening in Senja. In Senja and some other places around Norway they have this really smart system for cyclists going through tunnels. You push a big red button as you enter the tunnel and then lights outside and inside of the tunnel blink in order to alert people driving cars that there's one or a couple of cyclists inside of the tunnel. I only cycled for about an hour more that evening until I found yet another great wild camping spot overlooking the nearby fjord. There's a fair share of ferry hopping included in this bikepacking trip to the North Cape. But as long as you're prepared and have studied the ferry times ahead of time, the ferry rides themselves are actually a welcome break from all that time in the saddle. It allows you to charge your batteries as well as sit down and have a bit to eat. and the best thing, all the ferries here in Norway are completely free.
Tromsø is the largest city you'll pass through on this trip, and it's even regarded as the northernmost city in the world. The city is very widespread and very hilly in the city center, so it took me quite some time to get through it. I did, however, take advantage of what the city had to offer. Two things you can experience without having to get off or leave your bike for a long period of time are the Arctic Cathedral and the Arctic Botanical Garden. I found the Botanical Garden in particular very interesting. It showcases flowers and plants that only grow in Arctic regions around the world, which makes it rather unique. It's perfect for a lunch stop, either if you brought your own food or if you choose to order something from their cafe. Leaving Tromsø took just as much time as entering the city, although leaving the city to the east turned out to offer magnificent views of the nearby fjord. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to stop as often as I wanted, since I knew that there were two ferries coming up that I really needed to catch. And I started to feel a bit stressed that I had spent too much time in Tromsø to be able to catch them in the evening. But I made it just in time to catch both of them. After leaving Tromsø, you could definitely feel a shift in the number of cyclists along the road. Gone were most of the lightweight bikepacking crowd that were so common in the Lofoten Islands and left were only the hardcore ones with what seemed like a lot of gear strapped to their bikes. What united them all was that they had set their minds to climb the mountain passes and conquer the mighty winds the barren Norwegian landscape that lay ahead of them had to offer. It had already been a very long day in the saddle, but somehow I was still feeling fresh and the wonderful backdrop of the Lingen Alps sure helped me to try to put in a couple of extra miles late in the evening. Thus far I had been extremely lucky with the weather. So I guess I had it coming. On the seventh day I was supposed to make it over the Kvaneng Pass, which in good weather offers magnificent views of the fjord below. Unfortunately this was not going to be one of those days. Instead, I had to seek shelter a number of times in bus stops and roadside toilets to be able to avoid the worst of the rain. It was one of those days where you just have to dig deep and get the job done. I think we're finally at the top now. <laughs> Up in the clouds here. Here we have the first reindeer 
of this trip. I started the next day with a little bit of bike service after yesterday's constant raining. The weather looked really promising with clear blue skies in the morning. Little did I know that this would soon change and turn into one of the most challenging days. Both due to the weather and the terrain that laid ahead of me. As I was approaching the town of Alta, the rain was upon me again. And it hit me hard. Alta marked the last bit of civilization for almost the rest of the trip. And as I left the town recovering from the rain, a fantastic rainbow symbolized that I was entering the wildest and most remote part of my journey. I was entering Sennelandet Highlands. Sennelandet is Norway's largest highland area and it's classified as Arctic Tundra. Characterized by cascading rivers, snow-covered hills and high bushes. And I say bushes since trees can't really grow around here. This region is very exposed to the elements and the road is regularly closed during winter due to strong winds and heavy snowfall. The next day I had finally completed my journey over Senalandet Highlands and made my way down to the Porsangerfjorden, the fjord that would accompany me for the rest of the trip all the way to the North Cape. When you reach the small town of Oldefjord, it feels like you've reached another world or been thrust back to Lofoden again. Gone is the Laplandish tundra-like wilderness with lichens, bushes and birches. And it's replaced with picturesque small fishing villages and further on rough crags escorting the coastal road. This is also where the two major roads leading up to the North Cape converges. The road that you're already traveling on and the road coming from Finland and Sweden.
even though it initially felt like I had arrived at a more inhabited part of Norway, it was easy to forget that I was still basically in no man's land. With over a hundred kilometers to the next town and virtually no shaded flat space to put up my tent, I knew I'd be in some serious trouble if a thunderstorm were to catch up with me again. And just as I had that thought, I heard the first sound of thunder coming from behind. I continued to fight the storm for another hour until I finally found a somewhat flat space that was a bit shaded from the wind. <laughs> Woo! I quickly pitched my tent in the pouring rain and jumped inside of the tent. The final day had arrived, and even though I only had about 60 more kilometers to cover, I knew I was in for quite a challenge. The first order of business was to conquer the infamous dreaded 7 kilometer long North Cap Tunnel. It's finally come to this, the dreaded infamous North Cap Tunnel. I'm just about to head in now. But is it really as bad as people make it out to be? Well, let's put it like this. Going through the tunnel is basically like climbing an inverted mountain. Instead of climbing to the top, you'll descend to the bottom, 212 meters below sea level, without getting rewarded with a nice view at the top. <laughs> going down there meant uh, going down at like 40 kilometers an hour, freezing your hands off. And now I'm at the bottom, so in about 300 meters, I think, I see the road is starting to go upwards again. And once you enter the tunnel and start going down that steep slope at about 9% grade, the only way of getting out of there is to use your own two legs. Just after leaving the town of Honningsvåg, there's a sign saying that the North Cape is only 20 kilometers away. Don't get fooled that you've only got about two hours of cycling left. Instead, look at this as the final boss in a Super Mario Bros. video game. It's gonna throw everything against you to keep you from reaching your goal. Insane winds, heavy downpour, construction work, and crazy steep ascents. This is hard. <laughs> And did I mention the Goombas of the road, the RVs? The 20 km sign is just a way of deceiving you that you've got this. But you do got this. This is what you've been striving for during the past two weeks. Your legs have gotten so strong during this trip. No matter what this final boss is gonna throw at you, you're gonna stand there at the globe with your hands raised. And on the way there, you're gonna get rewarded with incredible views. So what's wrong with you? Dig deep and start pedaling. 
You're almost there. We're finally here! Over the past several years of bikepacking, I've realized that some of the greatest days I've experienced on my bike aren't the warm and sunny days when you're stopping for an ice cream break in the shade. Instead, what I remember most are the challenging days with pouring rain, endless tailwinds, and going through seven kilometer long tunnels under the sea. Days where you just have to dig deep and push yourself up that last hill. I knew when planning this trip to the North Cape that I was setting myself up for a handful of those Type 2 fun days. And Arctic Norway sure lived up to the hype. So I finally reached the North Cap after a couple of really tough days here at the end with both a lot of hills and especially a lot of rain and wind. Getting up here you really feel a sense of accomplishment after reaching the top of the world. So this video basically showcases the highlights from my trip up to the North Cape and I have a lot of more footage from this trip. In fact over 20 hours of footage that I'm going to be releasing over the next 10 weeks or so. So make sure that you're subscribed to be able to follow along on this fantastic journey. In the meantime you can watch another one of my bikepacking trips in northern Norway, this time from the island of Senja, a bikepacking trip that I did about three years ago by clicking the link up in the corner here. Otherwise, until next time, have a good one.